Good afternoon, everyone. I am Amanda Reddy. I'm the Executive Director of the National Center for Healthy Housing, and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this webinar focused on Proactive Rental Inspection, or PRI, presented by the Lead Legal Strategies Partnership. We're so pleased that you could join us this afternoon, and we are also grateful to the New York Community Trust for their support of the Lead Legal Strategies Partnership and, and today's webinar. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and we will make a recording available to all participants and to other members of the invited communities who were not able to attend. So there's a lot of information and if you're uh, trying to take notes furiously, rest assured that uh, a, a record, the copy of the recording and the slides will be made available to you to review later on. Uh, to help ensure better sound quality throughout the webinar and recording, we have everyone in listen-only mode and we'll keep lines muted for the duration of the webinar. However, we, we know that you have a lot of questions um, and we we're going to try really hard to make sure that we have some time at the end of the webinar to start to answer some of those today. Uh, but we also plan to be following up after the webinar to answer any remaining questions that we don't get to today. You can enter those questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the chat box or the Q&A box. Both of those boxes should be on the right side of your screen. Um, and you can, you can do that throughout the webinar. We'll try and keep tabs on that. There will also be a very, very short survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. We ask you to fill that out and give us feedback that will help us to improve our technical assistance to you in the future. Um, and that survey will also give you one final chance to enter any questions for today's panelists if you uh, wind up with a question that didn't get entered into the chat or Q&A boxes during, during the webinar. We have a lot of material to cover today, and joining me will be Greg Miao from Change Lab Solutions and Jill Heaps from Earth Justice. In addition to being founding members of the Lead Legal Strategies Partnership, we all share a passion for today's subject. I think that's going to come across um, loud and clear uh, just in the volume and the quality of the information that uh, all of us uh, have, have prepared for you today. Um, and I hope that you're going to leave today's webinar feeling both inspired and better equipped to take action in your own communities. During the webinar, we're going to start by giving you an o overview of proactive rental inspections, why they matter, what they look like, um, and taking a deep dive into the components that make up a PRI ordinance and program, as well as taking a look at uh, and discussing rental registries that often accompany these programs. We'll also discuss the critical topic of implementation and how to set up your community for success in implementing and maintaining an effective program. Then we'll spend uh, just a little bit of time looking at just a few examples of PRI in action. And, and just a side note here, there are a lot of examples to choose from. Uh, many communities around the country are doing this in lots of different uh, ways. So if today's webinar leaves you hungry for more of those stories, be sure to let us know. We can make sure to uh, provide those to you as well. We'll also take some time to have a frank discussion about the barriers and challenges, both real and perceived, that communities often encounter in setting up and running a PRI program. And then we'll close the webinar today with a note about a few resources where you can get more information. Um, and as I said earlier, if there's still time after all of that, um, we'll begin to answer some of your questions. And if we don't have time for some or all of the questions today, we'll still be addressing them following the webinar, either in written format uh, that we'll send out via email or on your monthly coaching calls for those of you who are a part of one of our technical assistance cohorts. So why a webinar focused on proactive rental inspection? Uh, at the end of last summer, many of you attended our legal strategies webinar where we highlighted a range of strategies and approaches that communities can and are taking to address lead poisoning. Many, many of the questions and follow-up requests um, after that webinar centered around the topic of PRI. And that topic has also been a focus of conversations during the September RWJF grantee convening and on many of our coaching calls with grantee communities. Some of you already have ordinances and programs in place, but are looking to revive or strengthen them. Uh, others are starting from scratch. So you come from a variety of perspectives, but nearly every community that we've been working with uh, over the last couple of years has shown an interest in taking a closer look at PRI programs across the country. And to be quite honest with all of you, even if there hadn't been such a strong and universal interest in this topic, we would likely be here today anyway, trying to make the case to you that PRI is a really important and potentially really powerful systems change tool that can not only be used to combat lead exposure and improve housing quality, but also a tool to help tackle health disparities and create more equitable access to services in your communities, uh, which we know is important to uh, many of you as well. 
So I'm going to uh, turn it over then to uh, my colleague at Change Lab Solution, uh, Greg, and uh, he's going to start us off by telling us how we get it right. What is PRI and what does it look like? Greg? Uh, thank you, Amanda. So, um, let's see if we can get this moving along. There we go. So, uh, what is proactive rental inspection? Well, most cities maintain code enforcement programs where the city enforces building codes and housing codes to ensure the, the safety and welfare of their citizens. Traditionally, these code enforcement programs have operated on a complaint basis. A citizen makes a complaint about a code violation, a city code enforcement officer then investigates the complaint, and if substantiated, begins enforcement proceedings. Uh, PRI programs, also known as systemic or periodic code enforcement programs, are a little bit different. Uh, under these programs, all covered rental housing uh, has to be inspected on a periodic basis to ensure that uh, city housing stock is safe for tenants, uh, well-maintained, and the property values are preserved. Uh, although there are no uniform or standard PRI programs, they typically share a basic program structure, which includes registration of rental units, uh, periodic inspection of those units, uh, and then enforcement by uh, the city. So, PRI programs offer a number of benefits to cities, tenants, and the public as a whole uh, that complaint-based systems can't. All right. So what are those benefits? Well, the chief benefit of PRI programs is that they help ensure that unsafe housing conditions don't fall through the cracks. Uh, how could that happen in a complaint-based system? Uh, it's pretty easy, um, especially if you have vulnerable uh, populations in your jurisdiction. Uh, people don't file complaints. Uh, there could be a lot of reasons for this, including language barriers, lack of familiarity with the code system, um, or fear of retribution by a landlord. Uh, in situations where residents can't or don't file complaints, health hazards uh, can go unabated for long periods of time, just getting worse. Uh, so why do uh, proactive rental inspection programs? Well, first, proactive rental inspections uh, help preserve rental housing stock. This is achieved by relieving tenants of uh, the burden of having to force reticent landlords to make needed repairs and by providing landlords with notice of poor conditions, which then encourages preventative maintenance, uh, a more cost-effective solution than deferred maintenance. Second, PRI programs preserve property values. Uh, de deteriorating housing conditions cause property values to drop uh, and destabilize neighborhoods. PRI programs can help preserve neighborhood property values uh, and a locality's property tax base by preventing a concentration of blighted properties. And third, uh, PRI programs provide localities with valuable information via uh, the registration component, which helps localities know what rental properties exist, who owns them, and helps uh, them inventory their housing stock, helping uh, to tailor policies to meet identified needs. Uh, PRI programs also establish a new way of thinking about in code enforcement, uh, compelling housing divisions to take a prevention approach to housing enforcement. And then finally, you know, PRI is a social justice tool when wielded properly uh, that can help address housing uh, related health and other inequities amongst vulnerable populations in your communities. PRI programs can help ensure that resources are spent equitably and can also help raise the quality of housing for all residents. So with those reasons in mind, uh, let's now discuss some of the key components of PRI programs uh, and the different questions that come up uh, as a jurisdiction thinks about developing a program. Those questions include, how will we identify rental units subject to the program? Which units should be inspected? How often will inspections take place? Who will perform the inspections? Uh, what will the scope of the inspections be? How will we give notice? What, are, uh, what will enforcement look like? How will the program be funded? And finally, how will we know it's working? Uh, as I discuss these questions and, and components, I'll be referring occasionally to uh, our model PRI ordinance, which we made available to localities back in 2014. Uh, just a side note that we're in the process of uh, updating this model right now. So please look for that uh, to come out in the coming year. Uh, so this model ordinance provides the key 
components of a PRI program and offers options for tailoring the ordinance to meet the needs of your particular locality. In some instances, you'll see blanks that prompt you to customize the language of the model PRI ordinance to fit your community's needs. Uh, in other cases, the ordinance provides options, uh, and it also includes comments that describe the legal provisions in more detail. Some degree of customization will always be necessary to make sure that the ordinance is consistent with uh, your existing laws. So with that in mind, let's continue on. So how will we identify units? Uh, in a traditional complaint-based programs, inspectors know how to locate the housing that needs to be inspected because the complaint has been made. Uh, but in order to implement a PRI program, you need to know what rental properties exist and who owns them. Uh, there's a few strategies you can choose to, uh, to do this. Uh, first, you can do registration or licensing. Uh, for registration, um, generally what happens is that landlords are required to fill out forms that provide the city with information about their ownership and the fact that they're leasing these properties. Uh, generally, they'll pay a fee to do this. Without, uh, with any approach, you'll need to think about the initial notice you give to existing landlords about this registration component uh, and ongoing processes to ensure that landlords are registering their rental units uh, moving forward. Licensing uh, can sometimes be considered a semantic difference, but is generally a, a bit more um, heavy handed uh, and a bit more involved. Uh, and this generally requires passing a few requirements to, uh, for landlords to meet in order to get approved uh, to have a license to rent a unit. Some examples of cities that have done this include Boulder, Baltimore, and Tukwila, Washington. Uh, another issue that we'll, you'll have to consider whether you do registration or licensing is the frequency of renewal. Uh, some jurisdictions will require annual registration, others uh, require it only when there's a change in ownership uh, or upon a fixed term. So you'll need to consider your available resources and analyze what makes the most sense for the size of your jurisdiction. So then what housing are we including? Well, clearly the most effective program would be one that inspects all housing inside and out fairly frequently. Uh, but that scope may be beyond the ability of your jurisdiction to pull off. So some jurisdictions have chosen to focus on some, just some neighborhoods, while others have chosen to go citywide, but focus on multifamily units instead of single family rentals. Some places like San Francisco have elected only to inspect the exterior of multi-unit housing. Uh, some things you may wanna consider when choosing between neighborhoods to focus on include the age of housing stock, the prominence of existing housing complaints in that neighborhood, uh, and existing socioeconomic conditions. In addition, you may want to consider exempting certain types of housing. Some of the common exemptions include multi-unit residences where one of the units is occupied by the owner, the rationale being that buildings where the landowner resides are likely to be more uh, adequately maintained, uh, government subsidized housing uh, where another government agency is in charge of ensuring, uh, conducting inspections and ensuring habitability. Uh, new construction, uh, depending on how you define it, uh, you will have to figure that out if you do that exemption. It could be housing that was built within five years of the passage of the ordinance or housing that was built after the ordinance goes into effect. And finally, uh, hotels and motels. Non-residential hotels and motels and other transient housing are also commonly exempted, um, but we generally wouldn't exempt something like single room occupancy or residential hotels, uh, which are often um, house vulnerable tenants for longer periods of time. And so you'll see here in the ordinance uh, where we've defined this. Um, so we've defined rental unit, uh, housing unit, and it will be key in uh, identifying how broad or narrow you want your program to be. We've also identified exemptions. Uh, any exemptions will be based on the baseline definition of rental housing unit uh, and can include neighborhoods, zoning sections, or types of housing, such as uh, transient lodging, uh, which includes hotels and motels, but not residential hotels or single room occupancy hotels, rental housing units owned by government entities that are inspected by the government entity at least uh, once every five years, and rental housing units uh, located in a building of no more than a certain number of units, one of which is occupied by the owner. So on to the third uh, criteria. How often are we going to inspect? 
Uh, well, proactive rental inspection programs rely on systemic inspections to ensure that property owners adequately maintain rental housing. Uh, jurisdictions do vary in how frequently they require rental housing property to be inspected. Uh, so the frequency or length of the cycle uh, generally varies from city to city, and it's often done uh, a decision made based on staffing and resources, as well as political years, uh, political will. Um, excuse me. So it's important that we do it over a fixed number of years. A number of localities set a baseline standard for the frequency of inspections, uh, and then allow for deviation from that standard based on the property's record of compliance. Uh, some cities require less frequent inspections once a property, only, a property owner has established a record of compliance. Uh, some small cities will do annual inspections, while many in larger cities uh, do it on a range from three to five years. Uh, some cities will inspect smaller buildings uh, on a longer cycle uh, and larger buildings on a sh shorter cycle. Uh, this decision will be affected uh, by the scope of the inspection, the travel time within the city, uh, and the quality of the housing stock within the jurisdiction. For example, uh, San Mateo does approximately 500 buildings per, uh, per year per inspector uh, with a goal of inspecting about 10% of the housing of the units within each building. Uh, there's another question here that you'll have to figure out and that's, uh, does the city, when does the city wanna do the inspections? Is that at tenancy uh, or ownership turnover? At the inception of the new program for the new rentals? or after a fixed number of years, uh, upon registration or licensing of the rental units? Uh, and will they make some uh, variation depending on prior compliance? So then to the fourth criteria, uh, an issue. Who's gonna perform the inspection? Um, some jurisdictions use code enforcement officers employed uh, by the local jurisdiction only. Now, the reasoning behind this is generally that code enforcement officers are trained in environmental health and nuisance laws, as well as uh, building and construction laws, so that they have the skills to ensure inspections address health as well as uh, building safety concerns. Some localities, such as Boulder, Colorado, and Bury in Washington, require property owners to contract with licensed home inspectors instead. Uh, in Burien, uh, inspections are conducted by qualified rental housing inspectors, which are private inspectors who possess specific credentials that have been approved by the director of the PRI program. Uh, and in Boulder, Colorado, third-party inspectors or companies uh, are licensed by the city, uh, and which is made available to um, property owners uh, on the city website. And then some cities do an either-or option. So in Boston and Seattle, property owners may use public inspectors or authorized private inspectors. So this is another question you'll have to decide uh, on whether or not you're going to go solely within uh, with um, jurisdictional code enforcement officers or if you'll allow um, private uh, third party inspections. The practices will differ depending on state law, uh, historical practice uh, and political or economic decisions uh, by the local locality. Finally, uh, some cities do self-certification uh, where property owners graduate um, after they've established a record of passing inspections with no violations. Uh, Self-certification programs allow cities to allocate their limited resources to properties uh, most in need of inspections. It can also provide an incentive for property owners to ensure that their property complies with all applicable codes. A uh, locality would need to decide the criteria an owner must satisfy in order to qualify for self-certification. Uh, two examples of this are Sacramento, California uh, and um, Santa Cruz. Uh, in Sacramento, if no violations exist on the property at the time of inspection um, or are corrected within 30 days of reinspection, then the inspector issues um, an approved inspection checklist to the property owner and they're placed in the self-certification program, uh, only coming off of it after violations have been reported. Uh, in Santa Cruz, they're a little bit more stringent. Owners can request to go to be, uh, to participate in the self-certification program after they have a history of no code violations for the prior three years. Uh, the owners must then annually self-certify and pay an annual uh, self-certification fee. So after you've identified who's gonna perform the inspection, uh, you'll have to make some additional choices 
uh, based on you know, how much are you going to be inspecting for. Uh, many PRI programs focus exclusively on uh, exterior inspections and common areas of buildings since these are easiest to do. Uh, no notice requirements to tenant, no notice is required to tenants, uh, and research does show that there's a direct relationship between exterior conditions of a house and interior conditions. So San Francisco is an example of this where they only conduct exterior conditions, um, but then they'll conduct interior inspections upon complaint, or if based on their external um, uh, inspection, they determine it necessary to, to take a look at the inside. More comprehensive programs though, the ones that uh, you know, will achieve the best health results requiring the inspection of interior units. Uh, most municipal code enforcement departments have procedures and checklists that identify what inspectors should look for when conducting an interior inspection of a residence. Uh, and these materials, which are usually designed for the complaint-based systems, can be easily adapted for proactive rental inspection programs. Um, the process of implementing uh, the PRI program, though, does afford you an opportunity to review the uh, other aspects of code enforcement, such as the scope of the interior inspection to ensure uh, that the program is effectively protecting uh, the health of residents. Uh, importantly for lead poisoning prevention, we know that visual inspection is not enough. Uh, and any PRI program with a focus on lead should really be utilizing at least web, uh, dust wipe tests, sampling from floors, window sills, window troughs, and other areas that are likely to contain dusts. A final note on this, um, jurisdictions that want to conduct interior inspections but that don't have the resources to inspect every unit have generally used sampling formulas to do this. In Sacramento, for example, the inspection of a building involves um, the in, uh, interior common areas and then a random sampling of no fewer than 10% of the units in the building. If violations are found in those units, then the inspectors can inspect more or all units of the building. Um, this is skipping back just a, a little bit. Uh, here in the ordinance, you'll just see that when we, uh, identifying who's going to be performing the inspection, uh, we have some sample language here. So you'll see um, code enforcement officers have been defined. Uh, and you'll see some commentary on this defining inspector further. Um, there we go. So the sixth uh, question and, and key issue to decide is how are you going to give notice um, to tenants and landlords about the PRI program? Notice to tenants is, an essential, is essential to inform them about the purpose and process of inspections. Uh, it's necessary to reduce fears and encourage compliance. Uh, and it also helps uh, ensure that they may be there when the, the um, inspection is actually going on. Notice can also alleviate some of the privacy concerns that residents may have by giving them the opportunity to, in advance of inspections, store personal items that are unrelated to code enforcement. Um, a notice uh, should also educate tenants about their rights and duties and the rights and duties of a landlord. And it should convey uh, the key pieces of information, such as the date, time, fees, and process for the inspection. Notices should be clearly worded and provided uh, in a manner that takes into account language and other communication barriers. Um, and developing notices and other materials to support a periodic rental inspection program, it's important to look at local government uh, policies for guidance on language access. Depending on applicable federal, state, and local laws, translation may not only be a best practice, it may also be a requirement. So for example, uh, in Sacramento, part of the notice you give to a tenant uh, is a consent form that clearly states, as a tenant, you have the basic right to privacy and may deny the city permission to enter. You may be present during the inspection. If you will not be present during, at the time of inspection, the city requests that you consent to the inspection in your absence. To give consent, please complete the form below. So providing notice to landlords and tenants uh, best achieves these goals. Posting um, to apartment or mailing to individual units is uh, mainly a resource question. Uh, but at a minimum, some notice should be given directly to the tenant rather than relying on landlords with poor compliance records to provide it to them. So the seventh criteria then is how are we going to enforce the program? Uh, most cities and counties already have complaint-based code enforcement programs with enforcement mechanisms that 
can integrate into the enforcement methods of a PRI program. When an inspection identifies a violation, most localities will give notice of a violation and the landlord will have time to abate it. The notice will also spell out the consequences of non-compliance. If the owner doesn't remedy the violations within a given time, your enforcement options will vary depending on your state and local law. Some localities uh, impose uh, administrative, civil, or criminal fines for violations of PRI programs. And the type and amount of fines uh, can, uh, localities can charge is often contained, uh, or sorry, controlled by state law. Uh, some localities have also identified language uh, authorizing civil lawsuits uh, to seek an injunction, which is a court order mandating that the owner bring the house uh, housing up to code. And some localities have included language stating that uh, an owner's rental license permit certificate or registration will be suspended for failure to comply with the PRI program. This might mean that the owner is prohibited from collecting rent during the suspension period or is prohibited from renting units that are currently vacant or become vacant once the tenant moves out. So for example, New York City has adopted this approach uh, to enforcing their rental registry requirement by restricting landlords' abilities to bring um, action for non-payment against tenants in housing court unless their properties are on the registry. Uh, another example is LA, which has also passed a rental escrow program. So here you'll see in the model ordinance, um, the enforcement provisions that we have. Uh, in many cities and counties, the penalties or procedures for enforcement may not be separated um, may not be separately stated in the new law. Instead, the penalty provision is contained in state law or in another chapter or section of the government's municipal code. Uh, having a variety of enforcement remedies is the most effective way to ensure compliance with the law. Most cities and counties already have some of these things, um, but will want to integrate uh, more enforcement methods into their PRI programs. Our model ordinance includes some of the standard um, penalties clauses However, a local attorney should draft the enforcement clauses to ensure that they conform with state and local procedures. So the one question I'm sure everyone uh, is, is interested is, in is, how are you funding the program then? Uh, most PRI programs are funded solely or in part by fees and fines. Uh, these include registration and license fees, inspection fees, reinspection fees, and other fees such as missed appointments and late payments. Uh, however, you should note that laws of many states prescribe the ways a city or county may assess regulatory fees. In many states, there must be a nexus between the activity or the industry burdened with the fee uh, and the purpose for which the fee um, proceeds will be expended. In addition, the fee must not exceed uh, a cost of providing the service. Uh, and in some localities, the city or uh, um, city council or county board sets uh, specific fee amounts. In others, the legislative board may authorize an official such as the director uh, of the agency charged with implementing the program to set the fees. Uh, this section of your ordinance should be altered uh, to conform to the state and local uh, law and practice. So here are some sample fees uh, being charged by PRI programs. Uh, we have uh, many examples um, from others across uh, the country. But you'll see that there's a pretty wide range for program fees, registration fees, inspection fees, and reinspection fees. So finally, uh, how will you know that the PRI program is working? Uh, it's just a very good standard practice to consider adding a provision that requires a review of the PRI program uh, an evaluation of the program to determine how it's working and whether any adjustments need to be made. Some jurisdictions include a provision in the PRI program ordinance that explicitly states that the program will be reviewed to assess uh, its efficacy. You'll have to determine if you want, to, if you have the resources to evaluate the program and how much resources will be dedicated to do that. Uh, and whether you want to do it annually or every two to three years or on some other periodic term. At the same time, you have to determine what type of data you'll be able to collect in order to evaluate the PRI program at the specified point in time. And finally, you have to determine uh, 
what ongoing community engagement will look like. How will you solicit feedback from the community about how the PRI program is working? And how will you inform the community about the PRI program outcomes? Come on. So uh, our model ordinance provides this uh, type of provision. It includes uh, an annual review, but your jurisdiction can choose a different time frame, something that works better depending on the size of your jurisdiction and program. Uh, the ordinance also gives 12 different activities or data collection options that you can pick from to include in the report uh, of the evaluation of your program, including the number of uh, rental units registered, including details about any previously unidentified housing units that have been discovered, uh, the number of rental units inspected, uh, the number uh, owners compliance in allowing inspections to be completed within the time frame, the number uh, and types of referrals to other agencies that have uh, resulted as uh, part of the PRI program, and any recommendations for modifications to the program. So PRI programs can, appeal, uh, can yield very important improvements in a locality's housing stock, uh, but they may also amplify um, many of the challenges that arise with traditional complaint-based programs. Um, because proactive rental inspections typically bring inspectors into contact with a much wider cross-section of a locality's housing. And inspections are not initiated exclusively by tenant complaint. So here's just a few of the common challenges. Um, concerns have been raised about the unintended consequences of these programs. Um, because remember that P with PRI, tenants don't necessarily want the inspection to take place. Perhaps they come from a community with historical distrust for government. Perhaps they fear that the cost of the program will be passed down to them, or that inspectors will come into their unit and observe tenant behavior that will lead them to be evicted, like overcrowding or hoarding. And perhaps they don't want it because the unit they're living in is an illegal conversion, uh, and it's better than, you know, any housing is better than nothing. So the, the extent to which these concerns will exist in your community is going to vary. Um, and jurisdictions can do a number of different things to make sure these unintended consequences don't occur. Uh, for example, LA has a policy that if it finds an illegal unit, they will make the landlord bring it up to code rather than evicting the tenant. Uh, similarly, LA has integrated social service providers into its program so that tenant issues can be addressed uh, with other resources. And again, community engagement is uh, vital throughout this process. Uh, of developing and implementing your PRI programs to understand and alleviate the fears that the community is expressing and build community buy-in for the program. And I apologize, I skipped over the challenges. They are often identified as rent increases, tenant violations, and uninhabitable and illegal units. So uh, for uninhabitable and illegal units, uh, inspectors may find substandard housing conditions um, that immediately threaten the health and safety of residents. Or they may encounter illegal, illegal units that have not been registered or licensed, or that exist in violation of zoning uh, or building codes. Where possible, it's important to identify solutions that can quickly remedy these conditions rather than permanently displacing tenants. Uh, some options that, that cities have developed include amnesty programs and relocation programs. In an amnesty program, the city could grant amnesty to owners for a certain amount of time to give them a chance to bring the codes, the units up to code. Uh, Ventura, California has taken this approach uh, by suspending fines and penalties for up to 30 months. And the city also created an accompanying loan program to help owners cover the cost of bringing their units into compliance. Uh, in relocation programs, the city could include a provision in their ordinance stating that uh, if it's necessary for a tenant to vacate due to unsafe or unsanitary locations, the tenant's relocation costs and expenses are the owner's responsibility. A city could also set aside designated funds to pay for tenants' uh, relocation costs when the owner cannot or refuses to do so. Uh, the city could then bill the landlord for these costs or place a lien on the property to recoup the cost of operating that uh, relocation program. Rent increases. Um, 
there's another fear that owners may try to pass the cost of inspections, program fees, and repairs along to tenants in the form of rent increases, uh, resulting in tenant displacement. To date, there's not a lot of information about whether or not uh, this is happening or the extent to which it's happening, um, but there's the potential that PRI programs may result in uh, rent increases for uh, the tenants. Many tenants' rights organizations have supported PRI programs, even while recognizing that some owners may pass along the costs of program fees and mandated repairs to tenants. In any case, uh, it's important to discuss whether there are ways to lessen the impact of potential rent increases on tenants. It's also important to discuss the nature of your local rental market with tenants' rights organizations and others who know what the market is like. In cities with higher vacancy rates, landlords may recognize that they can't afford to lose existing tenants by raising rates. However, that may not be the case in all cities, uh, particularly those within tight rental markets. So that means that you might want to work to pass some tenant protections. Some rent control cities have built in protections against landlords raising rent to, um, to cover repairs. However, some rent control jurisdictions don't, and these jurisdictions may need to examine whether a PRI program will expand the number of landlords seeking to raise rents to cover costs. Uh, we also recognize that in many jurisdictions, local rent control ordinances aren't politically feasible or they're just not allowed by state law. Uh, one approach is then to examine whether your local locality's PRI program could be could require landlords to phase in any rent increases related to the program over a certain period of months in order to reduce the impact on tenants. Uh, in Los Angeles, landlords can pass through registration and inspection fees onto tenants, but if they do so, they must pass the charge uh, the charges on um, as a prorated monthly fees so that tenants can absorb the cost uh, over a course of a year. A city could also then consider uh, creating local loan programs, um, which they would make available to landlords who need help paying for repairs and who agree not to raise tenant rents for a designated period of time as a condition of receiving loan funds. So some examples of tenant protections that we've included in the model ordinance include uh, protections for retaliatory evictions. Uh, state law may protect tenants from retaliatory action, but it's important to ensure that those protections are in place. Um, rent increases, state or other local laws may address rent increases, particularly how the cost of property improvements may be passed along to tenants. Some states prohibit local governments from imposing rent control laws, which may impact the locality's ability to do this. Uh, we also have something in here on other retaliatory conduct, such as depriving tenants of use of the premises, uh, decreasing services as a result of uh, needing to make repairs, or interfering with the tenant's right uh, under the lease. And also an, a final one is relocation costs. Uh, funding tenant relocation assistance programs can help ensure that displacement resulting from code enforcement efforts doesn't result in housing instability and homelessness, which have significant negative health impacts. And then finally, the, the last challenge that you may encounter in, in operating a PRI program um, are tenant violations. Because PRI programs um, bring inspectors into more housing, they're more likely to uncover tenant side code violations, such as hoarding or units that are overcrowded or violate state or local occupancy limits. Um, so in this case, it's critical to prioritize remedying these violations rather than displacing tenants. Uh, this can be done through a number of ways. Uh, first, it's important to have pre-inspection outreach. Uh, Community-based organizations could visit homes prior to scheduled inspections to educate residents about the ordinance, identify problems in the unit, assist residents in preparing for inspections, and provide them with information about services. You could also provide um, supportive services for tenants um, by identifying organizations in the community that can respond quickly in cases where there is hoarding or overcrowding and ensure that inspectors are aware of these resources and refer tenants to these resources should they find those conditions. And then it's very important that you have adequate training for code enforcement staff. Um, and you could partner with CBOs to train code enforcement staff on hoarding, the importance of avoiding displacement where possible, and steps for referring tenants to CBOs or other supportive services. And with that, uh, we'll take just a quicker look into rental registries. And we're gonna do this because rental registries are really 
one of the core components uh, and, and tools that the jurisdiction has to ensure uh, compliance with the program. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, but what is rental property licensing? Uh, well, rental property licensing requires landlords to register their properties uh, before renting them out. And it can be coupled with inspection performance requirements um, that we talked about as part of the PRI program. Um, rental registration and licensing provide the mechanism for localities to effectively regulate the rental properties. They help them inventory and know what's going on in the community, uh, how much housing they have, and allows them to do the data analysis to understand you know, where are our hotspots going to be uh, for certain types of housing violations. Um, it also then uh, provides that hook so that uh, you know, the, if you're limited in terms of how much um, you can find the landlords for non-compliance, uh, it turns out then that being able to tell them that they can't lease their property is probably the most effective means for um, ensuring compliance. So rental property has been put, uh, license, licensing has been put into place in a lot of places. Just two more examples in addition to the ones we talked about earlier uh, include Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where landlords must obtain um, a rental, housing rental license annually, and annually in order to rent out units. Uh, this license process requires certification that the property is in compliance uh, with certain um, lead, say, lead paint disclosure and certification law programs. Uh, which can um, which require inspection of buildings built before 1978. Um, similarly, uh, or slightly different, Brooklyn Center has a licensing program that has um, a number of different license categories based on um, the types of code violations uh, that have been identified uh, so that they are both inspected on and licensed, relicensed on different frequencies and different terms, uh, and have accompaningly different fee structures set up uh, based on the amount of resources that have to go into administering the program for those cities or those uh, units. So some key takeaways for rental property licensing, it really does help um, enforce and supplement the uh, the inspection and certification programs that you might be running, uh, they can be utilized in a way and, and tailored in a way to incentivize, incentivize positive behavior. So much like you would want to structure a fee program to ensure compliance, the rental um, licensing process can also be structured in a manner that incentivizes compliance. But they do take uh, some resources to administer. And so there will always be a um, consideration there in terms of the cost of administering that program. And with that, I'm going to hand this back over to Amanda to talk a little bit about uh, PRI implementation. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, so, you know, getting the ordinance right is uh, definitely important, but anybody who has been involved in policy or systems change work knows that the effectiveness of a policy often comes down to implementation, right? That this is a policy that sits within a, a larger context of you know, other infrastructure and, and culture um, that will either make it work or not and, and achieve its intended outcome. This list of uh, 10 steps comes from a Change Labs uh, document uh, that uh, was developed with input from a number of organizations, including NCHH many years ago, um, to really describe some key components of what makes an effective system, right? So the ordinance is just one part of a system that really needs to be built in order for these uh, types of approaches to be impactful. Um, so this this has been around for a while, but it still has a lot of relevance today. Um, and Greg did a good job. He actually covered, I think, maybe even all of the things on this list, um, at least in some uh, degree, but I think some of these bear a little bit more time to unpack them, even though at first glance they may seem, um, seem obvious. So starting with adopting a strong housing code is that first step. Um, housing codes often use ambiguous phrases like safe and healthy and decent that, uh, you know, might mean something to public health professionals or, you know, people who are really strong housing advocates. Um, but, but 
you know, is subject to variation and an interpretation and application. Um, and that's obviously not great for improving housing quality or from an equity perspective. Um, also, many housing codes don't really properly address health-related threats in the home, such as pests, moisture, ventilation, and chemicals, um, you know, including things like radon, but also lead. Um, so if you are a community that needs to tackle this step, there are some tools um, available. So if this is something that you know you need to tackle before you even start to uh, think about the proactive rental inspection process or as part of that effort to uh, either strengthen or improve your inspection process, um, I just want to take some time to call your attention to a few tools that exist. Um, this includes the National Healthy Housing Standard. This is a document that was put together as a joint effort between the American Public Health Association and NCHH back in 2014, but with the assistance of many, many national experts. And what this is, is it's a set of performance standards for existing housing, or, or put another way, it's, it's a model code that brings public health rationale into building code parlance. Um, it includes seven sections and 38 subsections that cover a wide range of housing issues. Um, and it includes both what we call core provisions, um, where you know, this is what we see as sort of the, the standard that we would expect communities to want to adopt for communities who are interested in using housing code to protect the uh, health of residents, um, and then stretch provisions for communities who really want to go above and beyond and, and take that next step to really use that as a vehicle for strengthening health. Um, it's worth noting that um, the National Healthy Housing Standard addresses uh, many, many different aspects of housing quality that have the ability to impact health, but um, including, uh, including lead, as you see uh, noted here on your screen. I also uh, just want to uh, note that um, following the release of the National Healthy Housing Standard, NCHH worked with communities across the country, I think about 25 different communities, to compare their local codes um, to the International Property Ma Maintenance Code and standard that a lot of uh, uh, communities uh, use and implement, um, as well as comparing their existing codes to the National Healthy Housing Standard, both the core and the uh, stretch provisions, to see which percentage of the codes in each of um, these categories uh, were already present in the local code. And so you can see this is an example um, document that was produced for a sample community. Uh, the blue bars uh, represent the, the local code. The red dotted line is the um, IPMC. The purple line is uh, the core provisions or those mandatory provisions of the National Healthy Housing Standard. And then the green line is you know, if you had everything incorporated, you'd have 100%. Um, and what we saw here is that communities were able to actually um, see how their codes measured up um, where there was room for improvement and that this actually motivated change in um, in communities that we worked with. Uh, two examples come from um, Tukwila um, in Tukwila, Washington. The city council adopted an ordinance that um, incorporated the healthy housing standard within their local property maintenance code. They just incorporated it wholesale. Um, in around the same time frame in 2015 in Dallas, Texas, um, code officials decided to um, do this comparison and take the opportunity to update their local property code. Um, they were really specifically focused on issues related to respiratory um, illnesses. So they really focused on updating their codes related to pests, moisture, and excessive temperature. But they used this model language to update their codes. Um, and at the same time, um, took that opportunity to say, while we're strengthening the housing, housing code, let's put into place a proactive rental inspection program for the first time. So we have seen this type of comparison motivate uh, policy change in, in different types of communities. Um, and another note here is, you know, I mentioned that NCHH did that comparison for the initial 25 cities, but we recognized early on that we didn't want to be um, the, you know, the the gatekeeper for uh, that type of work to be done. And so uh, we created what our deputy director likes to call our TurboTax for housing code, um, also known as our code comparison tool that allows you to do this type of analysis yourself. Um, so the tool will walk you through a set of questions. It'll tell you how to find your local housing codes, what to search for in them, um, and then guide you through a set of questions um, that you uh, can answer. You can do this for all of the sections of the National Healthy Housing Standard or focus just on a specific section like chemical hazards um, that would include lead if that's uh, the specific section that your community is interested in. Uh, so you can really customize it for your community. Um, and then it will generate a customized report that will uh, not only detail your strengths and weaknesses, um, uh, and, but where there are and, and sort of char characterize that for you, but also uh, points to 
um, model language. So it will tell you which provisions you already have it, that exist in your local code, but also point to pr provisions that your local code doesn't include either in part or in full, um, but give you that model language to, um, to work off of. So just turning then back to uh, notes on what makes an effective system. Uh, we've already covered, as, as I mentioned, you know, many of the, the items on this list, uh, including including funding on training officers. Uh, you know, Greg mentioned the the need to make sure that code enforcement officers were uh, trained in all the applicable federal, state, and local laws, as well as with dealing with some of the sensitive issues like hoarding and other things that may um, come up. And I, I want to really emphasize that that training in the soft skills of how to work with landlords and tenants is really, really vital. And we see that uh, programs that operate effectively have really invested time in that. It's also important to um, think about training other members of staff, right? It may not just be the inspectors that going out to the homes that uh, need this type of training, but you know, folks who may be answering the phone, um, you know, or you know, dealing with the public or landlords or residents through any part of this process um, that could benefit from that training as well, um, just to make sure that residents and property owners feel supported throughout the entire process. Greg mentioned the need to uh, have partnerships, um, both with community organizations and with other agencies, um, and that's worth stressing um, again too. Uh, community organizations can help to educate residents, both landlords and tenants, um, about their rights and responsibilities, about the process, but they can also provide some of the needed supplementary services. Um, great Greg gave a lot of great examples of um, you know, municipalities uh, taking on the responsibility themselves of you know, relocation services or interpreter services or some of the other uh, service supportive services that, that are needed. Um, in communities where that doesn't exist, sometimes community partners are able to step in and, and help with those uh, connections that are, are needed or even just connections to other mental health or social service programs that may go beyond the purview of the code enforcement program itself. Those cross-agency relationships um, are also really helpful. Um, if you think about this from the tenant's perspective, you know, the responsibility for something like lead may be spread across multiple agencies, um, and that can make the process really confusing for tenants or lead to duplication of efforts, or even worse, um, is nobody taking responsibility, right? Everybody else assuming if somebody else is, is in charge and taking responsibility. Um, so it's really important to really develop those those cross sector uh, partnerships, but keep in in mind the tenant experience and develop partnerships um, that really make that handoff and that referral process seamless. Um, one example that I, I always like to highlight um, comes from Erie County and the and the city of Buffalo in in New York State. Uh, it, it, they are the uh, health department inspectors at the county level who do their lead and their healthy homes inspections are deputized code enforcement officers. Um, code enforcement exists at the municipal level so that they, um, when they're in the home doing a lead or healthy homes inspection, um, they can actually cite code violations and initiate um, you know, work plan or follow through on enforcement actions, which adds to the capacity of code enforcement instead of burdening them. It helps the health department, uh, you know, achieve their mission and get their critical priorities addressed and obviously um, streamlines the entire process for the resident. So um, just think about how you can, uh, you know, really step up your cross-sector partnerships to not only have an effective program, but make it easier on the residents. A lot of what, um, Greg talked about also really falls into the bucket of uh, what we call a cooperative compliance model. And this is really about transforming the traditional us versus them dynamic in code enforcement transactions um, and equipping your code enforcement team with the tools that they need to work with and support property owners throughout the entire process from why it's important to how it can be fixed to getting them connected to resources to help them do the right thing. And it's worth saying that if you do this well, right, if you if you have the right supports in place, if you're working through a cooperative compliance model, the reliance on enforcement becomes less problematic, right? So um, at the center here, I can tell you one of the number one questions and requests we get from communities across the country is, we have weak enforcement, what do we do? You know, we can't get anything done. And so one of the ways that you can handle that challenge around, you know, weak enforcement mechanisms is by building a robust system so that fewer properties even wind up in that enforcement pipeline uh, to begin with. 
we've talked a lot about ad adopting a proactive rental inspection, so I don't think I need to belabor that point. Um, but just a few more notes here. Um, the supplementary programs that we've we've talked about in a couple of different ways now um, are really important in in supporting that cooperative compliance approach, making sure that people, you know, know know their rights and responsibilities, um, that they are you know, have resources to um, you know, help with repairs um, you know, so no interest or low interest loan programs to help property owners do the right thing can be really really critical um, in, in having an effective program uh, you know assistance to with relocation uh, and, and other things uh, and then finally, although we've said a few things already about evaluation, I think it's also worth mentioning that this is another opportunity to bring in a health equity lens to your program and ensure that there's really equitable access to services. So, um, you know, we always like to talk with communities that, you know, about going beyond just tracking the number and types of complaints received, um, you know, that's the very typical measures, but looking at things like um, compliance timeframes, and then you know, and, and just look, looking at things that might tell you more about how the system is functioning, but then also doing that not just at the municipal level, but breaking it down by neighborhoods, um, because that can give you really good insight. For instance, if you have a, two neighborhoods that have the same type of housing stock, you know, and very similar characteristics and demographics, but you're getting a lot fewer violations in one neighborhood than another, that that might be a red flag to say what's going on here. Or if the compliance timeframes are really different between one neighborhood and another neighborhood, that gives you an opportunity to check in um, and make sure that your system is functioning um, as intended and serving all of the residents um, equally. With that, I am going to hand it back off to Greg, who is going to tell us a little bit about what this looks like when we put it into action. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. And I wanted just to say thanks again for emphasizing the application of the health equity lens to this work. You know, it's something that we think is really important. Um, and there are so many tangible benefits, as you've identified. So, there we go. Um, so we're just going to talk about a few examples of PRI in action. And as Amanda mentioned at the beginning of this, there are examples of PRI across the country uh, in cities of various different types, all sizes, all areas, um, from Omaha, Nebraska to you know the coastal cities, from cities of 8,000 or towns of 8,000 to you know New York City. So let's. Uh, talk a little bit about some of those examples. Uh, and with, with that, we'll look at Rochester first, um, which is widely considered to be the gold standard uh, for the PRI programs. Uh, this program became effective in 2006. Um, and why is it the gold standard? Well, let's take a, a closer look. First, uh, I'd want to talk about the PRI program's registration licensing component, uh, which is done via a certificate of occupancy. So Rochester operates a renewable certificate of occupancy program that is designed to help stabilize and enhance the city's neighborhoods by conducting regularly scheduled ongoing property maintenance inspections. Uh, certificate of occupancies are required to be renewed for any structure that has residential dwelling units. It's every six years for one and two family structures, every three years for multiple dwellings and mixed use occupancies that have at least one dwelling unit, and every three years for one to two uh, and one and two family dwelling structures located in lead high risk areas uh, where interior deteriorated paint is found and remedied by means of applying interim controls. Um, there are some exemptions from the cer certificate of occupancy requirement uh, for property owners who occupy a one or two family dwelling and for property owners whose spouse, parent, child, or sibling occupies um, a one or two family dwelling. Um, who may apply for the exemption. Um, additional scenarios that require a new certificate of occupancy, um, this is not a comp comprehensive list, but they include uh, a change of occupancy or use, um, or a transfer of title of a two-family, uh, unless the certificate of occupancy was issued within two years of the transfer date. So we've talked a little bit about the, the need to have this lever in place to ensure uh, compliance. But then what are the Certificate of Occupancy inspection activities? Well, the critical element of Rochester's Certificate of Occupancy program is the inspection, um, which consists of a visual uh, property maintenance inspection that includes the interior and exterior of the structure and premises. The inspector looks at things like 
paint and trim, interior mechanical systems like heating and plumbing systems, stairs and handrails, roofs, gutters, structural soundness, accessory buildings, fire protection and requirements, uh, and other, um, other things like that. Additionally, via the lead-based paint poisoning prevention ordinance that, it, that Rochester has, the certificate of occupancy inspections must also include a visual assessment for deteriorated paint and bare soil violations. For units and structures containing five or, for, or, or fewer units and, and that are located in high risk areas identified by the mayor, uh, where visual assessment identifies no interior deteriorated paint violation, dust wipe samples are required to be taken and tested for existing dust lead uh, hazards. High risk areas are based on the county health department's inspection and data. Um, and the fees for the certificate of uh, occupancy range from $60 for a single family to $100 plus $10 a unit for uh, five uh, or for over five, uh, uh, sorry, $10 a unit over five for mixed uh, commercial residential uh, buildings. Enforcement, uh, the city um, fines uh, violations via its administrative uh, code enforcement system. Uh, and these fines range from $150 for a first offense up to $1,200 for a third and subsequent offense upon default. Uh, evaluation, the ordinance requires an annual report to the city council on the number of inspections that have been done, the passage rate of um, the units that were inspected, the cost of operating the program, and the county health department must annually report this, uh, to the city the number, um, the cumulative number of elevated uh, blood lead children uh, and properties ID'd with uh, lead hazards by Census Block Group. Uh, before we move on, just some other unique features that I think are worth celebrating. Um, there is a provision, uh, prohibition of retaliatory action um, ordinance that Rochester has uh, that really help ensure some tenant protections. They also have a database for properties ordinance requiring the city to maintain a database accessible to the public of all the residential properties where lead hazards have been identified reduced and controlled. And then they also have a safe work practices ordinance uh, in order to uh, promote safe work practices in the um, uh, in relationship to lead paint removal um, and in compliance with the RPP rule. So are there some challenges and lessons learned from here? I think they are that it's okay not to dive in citywide um, at first. Rochester first focused on high uh, highest, uh, the highest of high risk areas. Um, there's always an opportunity to refine the program over time by studying the data it collects. Uh, again, why it's really important to create those databases. Um, and it, the intervention is not perfect. I mean, in 2015, there were almost a thousand children who had flood lead levels above the, the current CDC reference value, but it is working and it is helping reduce that. And the impact is pretty clear. Uh, through June of this past year, uh, over 183,000 units have been inspected for deteriorated interior paint. 48,000 units have been tested or referred to for dust wipe tests. Uh, and 118,000 buildings have been inspected for exterior lead hazards. And we've got a number of studies that have found that rates of childhood lead poisoning have decreased much faster uh, in Monroe County, uh, where Rochester is, than in other counties concluding that in addition to the national and statewide policies, local efforts may be the important drivers of population-based declines in the elevated blood lead levels. So the next example I wanna talk about um, is where we're gonna sort of look at the purpose of and the power of rental registries. Um, as we discussed earlier, uh, in order to uh, implement a PRI program, a locality needs to know what rental properties exist and who owns them. So New York City law requires uh, property owners of residential buildings to register annually with the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. If their property is a multiple dwelling unit, meaning there are three or more residential units, or the, uh, the property is a private dwelling, meaning that there are one to two residential units and neither the owner nor the owner's immediate family resides in that building. Uh, building registrations must be filed annually by September 1st or whenever ownership changes uh, or when the information on a valid registration changes. The registration fee is only $13, um, but it does help compile that database. Um, 
enforcement of the rental registry requirement uh, is important. So building with uh, buildings without valid property registration are subject to civil penalties of $250 to $500. Uh, and additionally, if the property has three or more units, the owner is ineligible to initiate a court action to recover possession of the premises for non-payment of rent um, against a tenant in housing court until they've done until they've registered the property. Um, and they would be unable to clear violations uh, that are found within um, unregistered properties. So the city's rental registry um, helps it operate its proactive preservation initiative, uh, which is a comprehensive approach to identifying and addressing deteriorating physical conditions in multifamily buildings across New York City before they endanger the health and safety of the residents. Um, and it has preemptively identified at-risk buildings and evaluates approximately 500 buildings annually through the initiative. Our next example is going to really focus in on the inspection activities. And for this, uh, I would point us all to Boulder, Colorado. Um, Programs must be uh, must designate whether inspections include uh, exterior buildings, interior common areas, and or individual units within a building. Um, the city of Boulder, Colorado does not rent, uh, operate a rental registry for its PRI program, uh, but it does use a, uh, utilize our rental license requirement. So in Boulder, all rental properties, absent some minor exemptions uh, in the code, are required to maintain a valid rental license. As part of maintaining the valid rental license, um, they have to go through a rental license inspection, which is required for all new and renewal licenses. Uh, this inspection must be completed by inspectors licensed through the city of Boulder. The scope of the licensing inspection includes visual inspection of the exterior structure, the windows, skylights, door frames, handrail guards, stairs, etc. A uh, visual inspection of the interior of the structure, and an inspection of light, ventilation, occupancy limitations, plumbing facilities, fixture requirements, uh, mechanical requirements, and others. Uh, notably, unlike what happens in, in Rochester, Boulder's required rental licensing pro inspection uh, does not include a dust wipe sample requirement, the, demonstrating a potential area for improvement. Uh, and then the final example I want to point uh, you all to is an example of community engagement and, and the process that one of the, the communities has gone through. Um, and we wanna highlight the importance of community engagement to help ensure the program's success. So very recently in, in September of 2019, the town of Burien, Washington approved its first PRI program. And this came after the request from the city council of its staff to draft a series of policies related to rental housing and increasing tenant protections. In response to that request in early 2019, City staff drafted a set of policies and held three community meetings to obtain feedback from both renters and landlords. After the third meeting, city staff revised the policies based on feedback received and held a fourth community meeting to discuss the revisions. At this meeting, the city received support for the policies from those in attendance, uh, and the city moved ahead just a few months later, approving the policies reflecting input received during that community engagement policy, which included the PRI program. Uh, the city's community engagement efforts have now shifted to conducting extensive outreach with landlords, property managers, and renters to prepare them for the new program. They've also created uh, new web pages on the city's website to provide public information uh, about these new policies and resources on the programs as it develops. Uh, th this is all in anticipation of um, an actual start date for the inspections in 2021. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jill to talk a little bit about um, other barriers and challenges to be overcome. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Greg. All right, I am just, Amanda, could you please give me the ability to forward the slides? Yeah, you have control, Jill. Okay, we are not, let me try this again. Ah. Okay, here we go. My computer is just taking a nap. Um, okay, overcoming barriers and legal challenges. Um, thank you all. I just wanted to say thank you all for your continued participation oh. into um, past the hour. Usually webinars only go for um, 60 minutes, but we had so much information that we wanted to share with you that we did want to go for an hour and a half. Um, so I'll try to wrap this up hopefully in the next 
five to 10 minutes, so we have time for questions, but um, I wanted to talk about um, some legal challenges that have happened recently around proactive rental inspection programs um, and some other challenges in addition to what Greg has already talked about, uh, challenges related to enforcement, um, pushback from landlords and financing. Um, so there was a big case that just um, was decided on appeal recently within the past um, two weeks, Mac uh, versus Toledo, which was a challenge to the city of Toledo's proactive rental inspection ordinance. Uh, and it was actually challenged by a group of real estate investors um, who were not happy um, with the ordinance. Um, so the ordinance itself, it covered housing for four or fewer units. Um, it actually, the city of Toledo assigned the compliance responsibility to the county health district, which is their health department. Um, and it placed responsibility for compliance on owners, um, which was already defined in Toledo's nuisance, uh, Toledo Code's nuisance ordinances. This will become uh, clear why it's an important later. And these were three pieces of the ordinance that related to the lawsuit. So the lawsuit, basically the um, challenger said that it violates the equal protection clause um, because it excluded la larger housing complexes. Um, they also said the city did not have the ability to let the county health district enforce the ordinance. And also that the definition of ordinance was so vague that the law was unenforceable. So the lower court in this lawsuit agreed with the challengers um, and basically said, we've made a permanent injunction blocking the, the ordinance from going into effect. So that went up on appeal and uh, the appeal partially overturned the lower court. Um, they've decided that the ordinance was rationally related to the problem it was trying to solve and therefore it didn't violate the equal protection clause. One thing that was important in the ordinance is that the city actually included in the whereas clauses that uh, most of the lead poisoning problem in the city came from housing units um, for four units or under, which is why it, there was a rational relationship. If that fact or data had not been in the whereas clauses, um, this may have turned out differently. The court also found out or um, concluded that the city of Toledo did have the authority to have the county health district enforce the ordinance. Um, but the the kicker, the actually court agreed with the lower court that the definition of owner was so vague that it rendered the law unenforceable. Um, and this is why it's important to have a lawyer um, when you draft these things. The uh, in this the definition of owner that was in the nuisance was so broad that it included anybody who was in control of the property, um, which makes sense if you want to have control over somebody controlling barking dogs that are on the property. But in this case, the definition of owner actually included the tenants and actually the way it was written had the ordinance apply that the tenants then had this responsibility to, um, to be in charge of the property. And that was um, basically so vague as to be unenforceable. So lessons that we've learned from Mac versus Toledo. Um, my first takeaway that it's really important to get buy-in from all the stakeholders before moving forward with the policy. Um, there's a question here of what would it have taken to get these um, real estate investors on board with this? Um, it's possible that they would have brought a lawsuit anyway, but you know the process, especially the one that Greg um, talked to talked about beforehand of public involvement and getting getting your landlords around the table, getting your tenants around the table, and having um, really crafting a, an approach that works for your community and getting everybody on board is is critical. Um, the second lesson learned that if you can cover all pre 1978 housing, it's best practice to do so. Um, Mac v Toledo actually had initially the Toledo ordinance initially did not cover all pre-1978 housing. And during this um, lawsuit, they actually changed the ordinance um, to now cover all pre-1978 housing instead of just four units or fewer. Um, so that part of the, the of the case isn't really applicable anymore, um, but it was a, a kind of a, an important warning that if you're going to limit what you're looking at, um, you just need to make sure you have a rational reason for doing that. Um, and then very importantly, from a lawyer standpoint, when you're drafting a policy, do not just copy something else, whether it's referring to another section of the city's ordinance or using um, another city's ordinance or news using another section of your own city's law without really understanding what the consequences of copying would be. Uh, another legal challenge that has come up recently is in Massachusetts, where the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center has sued the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. 
Uh, Massachusetts lead law actually applies to housing where children under six reside. And the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center has actually sued the Department of Public Health saying it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, they've seen that landlords are now refusing to, to rent to families um, with, with children. And so that this policy in itself therefore violates the Fair Housing um, Act. So takeaway here, a best practice if you're going to design a new program, um, don't limit your lead laws or your pro your PRI program to only housing where children under six reside. Um, and one thing that we saw Philadelphia actually had this policy and as they revised recently revised their uh, program, they have ditched this kids under six policy and um, apply it now to all the housing with um, some exceptions. So enforcement. Um, you can have the best policy in the world, but if you don't have enforcement, it's only as good as the paper it's written on. Um, so here are some potential and um, approaches to having better enforcement. Um, as Greg was talking about Rochester having being the gold standard, one of the reasons why Rochester's program is so um, attractive is because the city is there doing all the inspections. Um, and with the burden on the city, you just have more control over which rentals uh, are inspected. Um, Greg also mentioned that in Rochester, their um, lead ordinance passed with um, companion ordinance that requires reports on the number of inspections and the, and the outcomes. And this is holding the city staff publicly accountable. We, um, these reports have to go in annually and um, the actual report, because Rochester focused initially on these, um, the high risk housing, there was a section in that report that said, you have to identify which of your high risk housing you've looked at, and if by, I think it was year two or year, year three, if you haven't gotten to all the high-risk housing, you need to say how many you have left and why you haven't gotten there. Um, so this is really important, both public accountability and intergovernmental accountability. Um, um, and then also, uh, when, if the city is doing the inspection and they're relying on a rental registration to figure out which um, places to inspect, <laughs> excuse me, um, it makes a lot of sense that you should put some attention on um, making sure that you have all your reg rental registration, uh, all your rentals actually registered. So uh, in the initial go around really focusing on making sure everything is registered. Um, if you have landlord driven inspections where you're doing third party ins inspections, um, Strong data management can help uh, make it easier to identify those who aren't complying. You know, if we can make these registries, um, a lot of a lot of places now are starting their online systems where you can go through a house by house and see if you if you've been registered and if there are violations. Um, and so, for strong data management like that, um, it can help identify places that aren't being um, inspected and aren't being registered. Also, having municipal pr programs prioritize enforcement can be really important. Is your mayor, is your county executive actually making this a priority? Um, you know, some places ha are now having drawing a lot of attention to the issue of fees and fines that are being levied on certain communities, particularly in relation to um, moving violations with your cars or other things. And you know, is there a, uh, an opportunity here to really get your community to to shift the focus from hard line enforcement on some of these you know driving violations and things that could really impact people when you're taking away licenses to fines and violations for um, better resourced um, individuals that are actually impacting public health um, if they're not done and also having fines and fees as a part of the program budget if you actually design a program well these these um, fees can sustain the program so making sure that everybody is is all in and everyone's paying their share um, can be an important aspect of enforcement. Um, bringing public attention to the issue can also be an effective tool. Uh, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest had a really interesting report lately about comparing the enforcement in New York on um, laws related to food trucks and laws related to housing fines and which what percentage of the, of the fines were collected. And it was it's an astronomical difference um, between that fines levied against food trucks for being too close to a building or things like that um, were exponentially collected at a higher rates than than housing fines um, in New York. And that was a way that they did that report to bring public um, attention um, and decision maker attention to the disparity there. Um, also, 
in Buffalo, there was a, um, a few years ago, there was an article about um, fees and fines not being collected in the housing court. And so, you know, your press may also be able to help you with enforcement and fee and fine collection as well. Um, pushing back from landlords, if you if you have unhappy landlords, they can throw a wrench into the system. Um, they may sue to challenge the law. They may just fail to comply. Um, and actually in Dallas, they had a couple of um, slum lords that said, oh, you're actually gonna enforce these ordinances, fine. I'm gonna take these properties off the market. Uh, and it was actually a real crisis for quite a moment because even though they were slum lords, um, this was at least housing and it was um, low rent housing. And um, the threat of taking these properties off the market um, was terrifying for for many of the of the tenants uh, because they had nowhere else to go. So fortunately, um, just keep an eye out for those. And in Dallas, um, some of the crisis was averted. And if you want more information about that, uh, Amanda and her team was involved in that. Um, some potential approaches on pushback from landlords uh, involving the landlords in policy development uh, and specifically asking for their input. Um, Buffalo has piloted a landlord stakeholder group um, and they actually have specific outreach to landlords and they've been asking landlords for their opinion on, um, on policy and actually in their own landlord group so that they can have um, frank discussions there. Um, a strong enforcement approach can't can't combat outright failure to com comply. So we need to be focusing on um, what steps you take when you've got people who just do not, uh, are not complying with the law. Um, and threats to take property off the market can be stressed through, uh, addressed through strong partnerships. Um, financing, you know, expense, I don't need to tell you all this, but inspection programs can be expensive. You've got staffing costs, the cost of the actual inspection, um, remediation abatement costs, which should be coming on the landlord, and then tenant protections, um, which may, may come from the tenant, or it may come from the landlord, and it might come from the city, or it might raise costs through the tenants. Um, some potential approaches. Um, First, you want your PRI program. There's a lot of options here, but basing it in financial reality um, is really important to be successful. Um, so city inspections model might be cross, cross prohibitive if you've got a very, very large city uh, and then third party inspections might be the way to go. Um, if you have CALEC programs that say, you know, every time we find lead, it's gotta be completely abated, um, but we don't have funding for that and you've got housing that's um, low value housing and the cost of the abatement is about as much as the housing costs that that kind of project even though it looks great on paper is going to fail um, your financing might dictate how often you inspect what methods you use to inspect and the type of remediation um, you require for the violations um, but be careful what you compromise because of cost considerations so um, greg had mentioned earlier that visual inspections are not best practice um, you know xrf um, and dust wipes are more expensive, but um, visual inspections are not best practice. And that we know that because there's been lead poisoning cases in public housing that only have required visual inspection. Um, there's some tools out there. GHI has a funding toolkit. Um, Cleveland, as part of their um, revamp over the summer, has a lead safe home fund that's really critical to their, pro they see it as critical to their program success. And it's to help property owners pay for lead testing and remediation. Um, they want a $10 million pot overall with funding, five million of funding from the city. And Buffalo actually, I'm proud to announce, is, uh, is on the way, its way to having a, a revolving loan fund um, that would help finance repairs um, for dwellings in Erie County. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Amanda to close us up. Great, thank you uh, to Jill and Greg for that wealth of information. And hopefully um, those of you listening would know we've spent a lot of information over the last hour and a half um, are walking away with the idea that this is possible, that there are a lot of tools and resources out there, that this is important for um, not only improving housing quality and combating lead poisoning, but achieving health equity. Um, and also another theme that we hope that has emerged through this is the value of partnerships. Um, I think we'd be remiss without um, just really calling that out. I think for all of our remarks, partnerships were really key to not only having an effective program, but even um, staving off some of the barriers and challenges that both uh, Greg and um, Jill outlined. And, and one thing that, that we have spoke about a lot when we were uh, designing this webinar was the importance of uh, bringing those partners in really early to the, the process. So um, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, took some time to really emphasize that point also. So these, these partners are important. And if you bring them to the table early and mobilize these tools, um, you can really have a power 
powerful impact. Um, as we near the end of today's presentation, um, I want to encourage folks, we've been seeing some questions come in and we may be able to get to just a few of them um, before we close out, but keep putting them into the Q&A and chat boxes because we will be following up with written responses so that everybody can benefit from all of the questions that we received. Um, uh, we'll give you them in written form that we can also address them in your monthly coaching calls if you're one of our grantees. Um, we will be uh, providing not only the recording of today's presentation, we'll also make the slides available to you. Um, and in uh, providing the slides to you, I also want to note that uh, many of the slides uh, we've already presented have hyperlinks and resources. Um, this last one brings a lot of those things together, um, in including uh, linking you to some of the really important tools that Change Labs um, highlighted, um, as well as a wealth of other case studies of, of how this work is getting done in other communities around the country. Um, I want to note with just a few minutes left, we just a few questions here. Um, we had a few questions come in about sharing some of the um, papers that were mentioned specifically, uh, the study on uh, the declining lead poisoning rates in Monroe County and the uh, resource, Jill, that you just mentioned, that report from the New York lawyers for the public interest. Yes, we will, um, as part of our follow-up communications, make those um, materials available as well. And with just um, a few minutes left, we'll tackle a few of your questions. Um, we, we won't get to all of them, but we will be following up, as I've said. Um, so this first one, um, Greg or Jill, if one of you can tackle this, um, was a question just to clarify um, how proactive rental inspections is differ different than a rental licensing program. Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? Sure. Um, so a proactive rental inspection is different than a rental licensing program in that uh, it includes an inspection aspect. So you could potentially have a rental licensing program where you just ask the landlords in your, your jurisdiction to submit their, you know, file their registration fees and you just know where the units are. Um, it would not necessarily change the, the traditional uh, complaint-based code enforcement and you would just have a, you'd have data about those properties, but you would not actually be conducting uh, proactive inspections. So a PRI program, um, is you know and you can also similarly have a pri program without a rental registration aspect uh, there are cities that certainly do that it becomes very hard for those uh jurisdictions then to you know know exactly how effective they're being you, they might be relying more on uh, anecdotal information about where they need to be conducting their inspections uh, or they may be doing it in a systemic manner um, but not necessarily you know certain that they're capturing all of the rental properties in their in their um, jurisdiction. So they are slightly different. Um, I think right. what's most important is just to say that uh, a strong PRI program will always will have a rental registration aspect to it uh, because that is ultimately one of the biggest levers that you will have um, to say you are no longer allowed to lease this property or make money off of this property um, if you don't bring this property into compliance. Great. Thank you, Greg. And we do have a, a number of other questions that have come in, some really great ones. Um, I'm sorry that we won't have time to discuss them today, but you guys have been so patient um, sitting through the last 90 minutes with us. Um, keep entering those questions in. We will follow up with, uh, with all of them. And then as you leave today's webinar, we encourage you uh, to fill out the uh, exit survey. And let us know what other um, assistance or tools you could use on this subject. Um, and we thank you for attending this webinar. I want to thank again our presenters and panelists today, the New York Community Trust, and all of you for, for spending the afternoon with us. Um, this concludes today's webinar.